Hello everyone. Welcome to this short presentation on bandwidth paths in 5G. As we keep on getting asked about this time and again. Let's start with channel bandwidth in 4G. In LTE, the channel bandwidth could be 1.4 megahertz, 3 megahertz, 5 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 15 megahertz, uh, and 20 megahertz. Please do not get confused about carrier aggregation as I am just talking about the possible channel bandwidths for a 4G network. The maximum bandwidth is 20 megahertz, and all 4G devices support up to 20 megahertz channel bandwidth. In 5G, as we have discussed time and again, there are three types of spectrum that is needed. The coverage layer, which is sub 1 gigahertz, the capacity layer, which is between 1 and 6 gigahertz, and the most popular uh, 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 spectrum band in that particular range is the 3.4 to 3.6 gigahertz. And finally, the high throughput layer, which is above 6 gigahertz and below 100 gigahertz. 3GPP has defined new radio bands FR1 and FR2 ranges as part of uh, 3GPP release 15. Frequency range 1 or FR1 goes from 450 MHz to 6 GHz. The upper range of 6 GHz is changing to 7.125 GHz. Frequency range 2 or FR2 has uh, been defined as starting from 24.25 GHz and going all the way up to 52.6 GHz. This FR2 is generally also referred to as millimeter wave band, even though technically millimeter wave starts from 30 gigahertz. This is from the 3GPP specs showing bandwidths uh, supported uh, for different FR1 5G bands. As you can see, it can go from 5 megahertz minimum to 100 megahertz maximum. Not all bands support all bandwidths. So one of the most popular bands, which is known as band 3 or 1800 MHz band, uh, is known as now uh, N3 in 5G. And it supports a bandwidth of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 and 30 MHz. Similarly, the most popular coverage layer band, band 28, supports bandwidth of 5, 10, 15 and 20 MHz. If you look at the most popular capacity layer band, uh, N77 or N78, you will see that it covers most of the defined bandwidths from 10 megahertz to 100 megahertz. So just to summarize, uh, 5G FR1 bandwidths go from 5 megahertz to 100 megahertz. If we now look at bandwidths of frequency range 2, it's much simpler. The supported bandwidths are 50, 100, 200, and 400 megahertz. So these FR2 bandwidths can be seen in the picture here. Let's look at bandwidth part, also referred to as BWP. In earlier version of 3GPP specs, it was called carrier bandwidth part, but carrier has now been removed. So as you can see from the picture, the carrier bandwidth has been split into three bandwidth parts. Now remember, this is just an example that the number three is not like standard. You know, you can have more bandwidth parts or less bandwidth parts, but I'm just taking three bandwidth parts uh, for this particular example because I found this nice picture from Road and Shorts. So I'm just using this as an example. So the first bandwidth part uh, with the green resource block has subcarrier spacing or SCS of 30 kilohertz. The second bandwidth part with a resource block uh, has a subcarrier spacing uh, of 15 kilohertz, while the third bandwidth part with blue resource blocks has a subcarrier spacing of 60 kilohertz. They are each used for different scenarios, and each 5G device can support smaller bandwidths than the maximum specified for FR1 or FR2. So why bandwidth part? In LTE, the maximum bandwidth is 20 MHz, so it's easy for all devices to support this bandwidth. In 5G, uh, new radio, as we saw, the maximum bandwidth is 400 MHz for FR2. Cheaper devices may not want to support this large bandwidth. 
Also, a device does not need to monitor the whole of bandwidth for, for power consumption reduction. Hence, bandwidth part allows device side receiver bandwidth adaptation to reduce the device energy consumption. A small bandwidth is used for monitoring channels and receiving low or medium data rates while dynamically using wideband receiver only when needed to support very high data rates. Release 15 only supports single active bandwidth parts, but this will likely change in future releases. So as discussed, bandwidth part was referred to as carrier bandwidth part in the early version of the 3GPP technical specifications, but renamed as bandwidth part in the latest version. Uh, bandwidth part is a contiguous set of physical resource blocks selected from a contiguous subset of the common resource blocks. For a given numerology on a given carrier, it is as shown uh, in the picture. A UE can be configured with up to four bandwidth parts in the downlink and with up to four bandwidth parts in the uplink with a single downlink bandwidth part being active at any given time and a single uplink uh, bandwidth part being active at any given time. <clears throat> if a UE is configured with supplementary uplink, the UE can in addition be configured with four bandwidth parts in the supplementary uplink uh, with a single supplementary uplink bandwidth part being active at any given time uh, at any given time. As far as signaling is concerned, all UEs have to be able to read the system information. Hence, an initial bandwidth part is configured to allow all UEs on the cell to read the SIPs. In case of ENDC or option 3, the bandwidth part information has to be explicitly configured in the RRC connection reconfiguration procedure. During the RRC connection setup, which would, uh, which would apply to all scenarios where new radio is the master or RRC connection reconfiguration, which would apply to all scenarios where, where new radio is the secondary node, up to four bandwidth parts can be configured in the UE. Only one bandwidth part, as we discussed, is active at any given time. So there are three different procedures uh, for bandwidth part change. First is using uh, RRC messages like the RRC connection reconfiguration. The second is timer based. So there is a BWP inactivity timer. And when the timer expires, the UE switches to a higher layer configured default bandwidth part. And the third is based on downlink control information or DCI. Share tech note explains the DCI control information very nicely. I'm not going to go into details here, but just wanted to show the DCI format 01, which is used for uplink scheduling and DCI format 11, which is used for uh, downlink scheduling. As you can see, they both have uh, this bandwidth part indicator, which could take uh, zero bits, one bits or two bits. And depending on uh, whether it's one bit or two bits, uh, they have different interpretation as you can actually see on the bottom right hand side. So this is the final slide which shows, uh, uh, which shows this picture from again from Roden Shorts. As you can see, it explains the bandwidth part switching very nicely. The UE acquires the cell on initial bandwidth part. The RRC, uh, the connection setup or the RRC reconfiguration then configures up to four bandwidth parts and activates one of them. The bandwidth part can then be changed during the operation using DCI. Here, it should be noted that bandwidth part switching via DCI scheduling is a very fast mechanism for adapting various QoS requirements to the physical layer, but it is optional for the UE. Similarly, the DCI scheduling procedure for a bandwidth part change may be used for purpose of numerology change by scheduling radio resources to fulfill different QoS requests, example, a change from UR LLC to the EMBB data scenario. Finally, as we mentioned earlier, a BWP inactivity timer is started by the network. This timer can take a value from two milliseconds to two seconds. When this timer expires, the UE goes back to the default bandwidth part. 
This is a very useful mechanism as this means there is no need for additional signaling from a network for changing the BWP to default. Finally, a plug for this very nice book from Rodin Schwartz. I managed to get a copy during MWC this year, but they are soon going to release an ebook that can be downloaded by anyone. You can register to receive a copy. The link is available in the slides and you can download all slides from 3G 4G from our SlideShare channel. So we hope you enjoyed uh, this short presentation on bandwidth part, which is actually a bit longer than what I thought it would be. As always, please leave any feedback, good or bad, below in the comments. Please subscribe and help us spread the word. Thank you.